Okay, we are picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 46. It is Wednesday, July 10th. Anyone looking on video that couldn't find July 3rd, sorry folks, I had to be absent. So we've been two weeks out, feels like an eternity out. Uh, so I'm going to start us back at the beginning of chapter 46. We'll just briefly do the first couple of verses because we really had done that. And I'm thinking right in there, I can answer one of the questions we had toward the end of our last class. So those of you who remember the discussion of the tree, we'll, we'll revisit that also as we go back into this review. Um, I believe there was another question before that, that we were looking at the possibility of it being in the book of Ezra, and it was uh, the people that were being told to move away from family members. I did not get a chance to research that one, so just for sake of continuity on the video, I will try to pick that up by next class. My uh, sincere apologies for not being able to get to it in a timely manner. Uh, but in chapter 46, if we remember the end of 45, Yaakov has just found out that Yosef is alive. His beloved son, whom he has thought for years has been uh, dead, he has found out is alive and well in Egypt and ruling in Egypt and is inviting the whole family to come down and be ministered to physically because the famine is so great everywhere they are. Now, Yaakov knew that God had told him to go to the promised land. We looked at this in length last time, so this is just the short version. But we know that uh, when he went out of the land, he went out looking for his wife. He was uh, in God's will to do that. The three days journey out was when the latter dream was there. Uh, we call it Yaakov, Jacob's ladder, but I always say whose ladder is it really because it was the Lord and it's a picture of the Lord. But uh, he assured Jacob that he was with him and that this was his will. And then the, uh, 20 years later after he's had uh, time to work for his wife and work again for his wife because he got a different one the first time. And then a few years after that, then when God was sending him back, he knew it was time. God told him to go home. And God had told him to go back to where he had been, back to um, Beersheba, but he also goes back to Bethel, Bethel, where that he called it the house of God because where that latter dream was, he thought was literally the open gate to heaven right there. <laughs> so he, we looked last week at the time, at the thought that as Yaakov is now being invited to go down into Egypt, is this right? His father probably relayed the story of when he started down for, for Egypt, and he was stopped at Gerar, and the angel of the Lord told Yitzhak, his father, not to go down to Egypt, that he would take care of him. So I'm sure there was a little mixed emotion. He definitely wants to go down and see his son, but is it right for him to go all the way, move, and live outside of the land of promise? So he starts off, we see that he goes from Hebron, to Beersheba, and Beersheba was a key place where he has stopped before, where his father has stopped and where his grandfather has stopped. We saw that he was there in chapter 37 and verse 14. We saw his father Avram was there in chapter 21 and verse 33, and his dad Isaac Yitzhak in chapter 26, and in uh, verses 23 and 25 in particular, and in each of those cases, Avram, uh, worship the Lord there. Yitzhak worshiped the Lord there. He called the Lord. They built altars to the Lord and offered sacrifices at that place. And we see that, that Israel, Yaakov's spiritual name, when he's acting in, as a spiritual man, that he set out uh, with what he had. But he came to Beersheba. He stops there and he offers sacrifices to the God of his father, Yitzhak. So he's really showing that he wants to be following the Lord. Whether he's to go, whether he's to stay, he wants to know and know that he's going in the will of the Lord um, and that God is directing him in that capacity. We see in Jacob's life, the time that he spent in Padan Aram, the time that he went when he ends up with Rachel and Leah and his, his 20 years there, that he typified often a, a man of God, but living in his flesh. There was a lot of flesh that went on during that time. Then when we look at his life in Canaan, his years living in Canaan, that was a man of God fighting in his own strength. Remember, he even fights against the angel of the Lord till he realizes who it is, 
and he caves in at that point. His life in Egypt is going to typify the man of God who is walking by faith. So he's being directed by God to go down to Egypt and he's trusting, even though he's been given the promised land, that this is where he's to go for a time. And we looked at the reason, at least one of the reasons why God is doing this at this time, is he's taking little Israel, who has been too quick to want to assimilate in Canaan and marry other idolatrous religious people, that would in time corrupt the the spiritual line. So God's going to send his little family down to Egypt. He's going to strengthen them in Egypt. They're going down about 70 in number. We'll talk about that in a bit. They're going to come out two and a half million plus uh, in number 400 years later. So yes, they did grow physically and strengthen, but Egypt found shepherds, which they are, abhorrent. Egypt wasn't a good mixer with other people. So they're going to be more confined to themselves to grow in their faith and in their walk with the Lord. This is going to give them a good time. Instead of looking to intermarry with idolaters, they're going to be intermarrying with each other and encouraging each other in the Lord. So we're going to see that the spiritual line is strengthened through this also. God is at work on many levels and for many reasons. Yes, Dora? But if they wouldn't have gone down there, they would stop there. Yes, yes, and that's why they're going. But how many times do we say to ourselves, and if you couldn't hear Dora, I should repeat, sorry, she said that if they didn't go down to Egypt, they would starve. They'd starve to death, and the land the, the Jewish people would cease to be, or the nation, I should say, because we don't quite have a Jew yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> um, but yes, sometimes we think things like that, and we jump out of the frying pan and into the fire because we're not waiting on God and trusting God and he would, would have rescued it in a different way. So I think Yaakov knew he had to do something. You're right. And he's the head. He's responsible. But he did want to assure himself that he's hearing the voice of God and following God. And we should in our trials and tribulations too. If you see what looks like the right way out, be prayerful about it. Is this of you, Lord? Is this the way I'm to go? So that's basically what he's doing. And what came up to when we look back at Beersheba, what we were talking about when we came to the tree, we saw that Avram had, had planted a, a tree, and most of the um, versions will say a tamarisk tree. And when we looked at this chapter in particular, um, we talked about this so just to bring back to your remembrance and mine too, because it was 200 pages of notes later, <laughs> um, that we saw that in the Hebrew is Eshkol, and that it means uh, an everlasting, or no, I'm sorry, it was a grove that was an ever, the, the tree was everlasting, and the grove of trees were an everlasting tree. But when we see the word eshel or eshel from the Hebrew, we get a little different meaning than just a variety of the tree. And the idea that we got as we studied it is that this is an acronym that involves eating, drinking, staying overnight, housing a stranger. Um, it could be accompanying a guest along the way. As you go into the root word of the Hebrew, you get more of these meanings. And so what we, the conclusion we came to is what we think took place here is that Abraham, in essence, kind of made a traveler's end right there, that he planted the, the, the grove of trees. He planted a place of refreshing. And then it is believed that he and his wife, Sarah, were telling those who would come their experiences in the Lord. So they were using it as an outreach to people as they would travel through. They could tell them about the living God, the God of Israel. And we know that, that there were travelers, and we know that the word of God went forth in different ways because when we get further down the line and we have that it's time for the children of Israel to go conquering into uh, the promised land under Joshua, Joshua, that Rahav, a harlot in an evil city called Jericho that she had heard about the living God of Israel, put her faith in that living God of Israel, and it spared her and her whole family their lives when Jericho collapsed. So we do know the word of God went forth. There were ways that it was getting out, and there is great evidence to believe that this is what was taking place with Abraham and Sarah. So I imagine, and I can't give you fact, and we'll find out whether I was right or off track on this, but I would imagine that there are others who have been keeping that in going now. 
And so Yaakov is stopping on the way, bringing his entourage where they can get refreshed on their traveling. But he's recognizing also, this, is, this was my grandfather's plant. You know, he started this here. His testimony is here. They had a place there to offer the sacrifices, and he's refreshing himself in the Lord as he goes down. So just a good reminder, a good refresher, Beersheba um, on his way, Beersheba, we saw so much happen there, uh, what I've already said, and uh, Avraham's, his, his roots there, Yitzhak moves wells there. Um, later we'll see that Samuel's sons were judges in Beersheba. Um, it's the territory of Shimon and Judah, the two sons that have this territory when the, the land is divided. Um, the prophet Eliyahu, Elijah, found refuge at Beersheba when Jezebel had ordered to kill him. The prophet Amos mentions Beersheba in regard to idolatry. And if you finally even have the phrase describing the promised land from Dan to Beersheba. And that meant from the north to the south. So it became um, quite a name in scripture as we revisit it again. We studied that again all the way back in chapter 21 if you want the details. But just the overview as we go on now we see it was a good place for Yaakov to get refreshed in the Lord. To know this is the path he's to go on. To know he has the mind of the Lord and to move forward. And that's what happens because look at verse two. Verse two says, God spoke to Israel, or spoke unto Israel, whichever way your translation has it. And last time we also mentioned that that was the seventh time that we have specifically that God spoke to Yaakov, to, to Israel, um, whichever name that we're using. So just flying through them, not with all the verses because it's in our last video, that when he left for Padan Aram, that's when he went and, and meets Rachel, Rachel, when it was time to leave Padan Aram, when he was about to meet Esau twice, he, the, uh, God spoke to him when his sons slew the Shechemites, that uh, that was a time the boat rocked and God spoke to him. When he returned finally to Beit El, the house of God, where the latter dream had been, and now the seventh time. Seven in scripture often speaks of completion, or perfection, we can see that Yaakov, Jacob's journey from Canaan, and then away, and back to Canaan, and now down to Egypt, that this is all the completion of the journey that God has for him. Often the leading of the Lord will start with circumstances, and then it's confirmed by the word of the Lord. In other words, we don't know that the Lord is directing, leading us in another way until something happens, and usually we feel like the boat's rocking. But that's when there's opportunity for God to step in and say, this is of me, walk this way, go this way. And that's what we see. He's assuring Yaakov, this is the way to go. So 40 years before, when Yaakov was about to leave the promised land, God gave him a dream. That dream that I keep referring to about the ladder. Now he's about to leave the land again. And God's giving him assurance again in a night vision because in, in at verse 2 it says that God spoke to him in visions of the night. So this was a, a way that God spoke to Yaakov and he knew was the voice of the Lord. Here's where I believe we're picking up news. So I'll start going uh, more word by word. We have uh, that, that he told him Yaakov, Yaakov, and Yaakov's response was, Hineni, here am I. Here am I. He was ready and, and wanting to hear the voice of the Lord. So verse 3, the answer was, he said, the voice said, I am God, the God of your father. In our Hebrew we have I am Elohim. Elohim is the strong and the faithful God. So God is reminding him, I'm your strength and I am faithful. I'm the God of your father. Who's his father? Yitzhak. Well, we know how God was with Yitzhak through all of his life. And again, he told Yitzhak not to go down in a time of famine. That was in chapter 26. So Yaakov again is right to say, okay, Lord, is this different for me? Am I to go? And so he gives him the promise. This God, this faithful God, this strong God, the God of Isaac also, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Well, I don't think it could be more clear than that. I'd love to hear the Lord answer my prayers that specifically. <laughs> and sometimes he chooses to. Sometimes we walk in a little more by faith than, than that. But he made it very clear. 
it's of me you're to go down to Egypt and what's going to happen for I will make you a great nation there now I want to take you fast to Shemot Exodus chapter uh, 1 and verse 7 and if you have cross references from me please realize I made a mistake what chapter? it's Exodus chapter 1 in your cross references it says Exodus chapter 11 I think my finger stuck on the one button <laughs> sorry chapter 1 whoops Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7 okay because God's promising Yaakov I'm going to make of you a great nation remember I've already tipped my hand and told you there's about 70 people that are of the family of Yaakov at this point in Shmot in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7 it says but the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now, Exodus 1, Shemot chapter 1, obviously is some time later. We're headed toward the time of God raising up Moshe to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And as I said, they're going to come out of Egypt two and a half million plus. Could even be three million for all what we really know. <coughs> So obviously, this is showing you God's keeping his word. He promised Abraham a large family. He promised Yaakov, I'll make of you a great nation also. And in Exodus, we're reading, God did it, okay? But back here in Genesis 46, what we're seeing is a renewal of that Abrahamic covenant. Again, when you see Elohim, Elohim is the covenant-keeping God. He's a God that makes covenant with the people. And one purpose of going down to Egypt now, as I mentioned, is preventing assimilation. They're not going to be intermarrying with others because the Egyptians feeling racially superior, superior and reluctant to mix with uh, foreigners, especially with shepherds, we're going to see that was loathsome to them as, as it's put, or abhorrence. We'll see that in chapter 43 and verse 32 or we saw it there and we'll hear it again in chapter 46 that we're in you can sneak down to the verse 34 and see it there also the people of Egypt were a cultural people they were intellectually more advanced than most nations in the world at that time so there was value for the children of Israel what they would learn in that way would be good uh, but at the same time because they're going to be kept distinct it's like they get to go to school but they come home to their families so um, it'll develop their culture, it will develop their, I, I, I don't like to call it religion, but I don't know what else to call it at this point, their, their way of being obedient to God, which becomes relationship, that all of that's going to develop down in Egypt. So here we're seeing that God has said, I'm the God of your father, don't be afraid, I'll make you a great nation there. Verse 4, I will go down with you to Egypt. That's all I would need to hear. If God's going to go with me, I can move forward. That's protection, that's security, that's everything that, that we should need. But I love also that he didn't say, I'm going to leave you there. Remember, he's promised Yaakov the promised land. Egypt isn't the promised land. He says, I will go down with you to Egypt, and I also will surely bring you up again. And Yosef will close your eyes. So the nation, Yaakov's um, progeny, they will be brought up again because when it says that Yosef will close your eyes that means that he'll be in his son's realm when he does die because closing the eyes was speaking of death so you're going to go down you're going to be with your son you'll die down there but your family's going to come back the promise was given to him so uh, what an encouragement to him to know that what he won't see is not forsaken that he's not leading his family off track and they're going to miss out on the promises. No, God is saying that I will bring you back. And actually, technically, technically, his body gets to go back because he's going to be carried back into the promised land and buried in the promised land. He's going to ask for that and he does get that given to also, him. They're supposed to bring Joseph's bones back too, isn't it? Yeah, Joseph will also. Jacob gets buried there, we'll see, by, by Yosef. But then Yosef, his bones are also brought up in, into the land. Yes, yes. So they're all buried in that land. Um, their bones, the physical. Question? 
No, okay, you look like all of a sudden I triggered something. <laughs> I know the wheels are turning because I know you. <laughs> and that's a compliment, that's not meant. That's, I like to think too. So, sorry if I embarrassed you. I'm purposely not using your name. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We've known each other many years. She'll forgive me. Okay. Verse 5. Then Yaakov arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried with their father Yaakov and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. They took their livestock, their property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt. Yaakov and all his descendants with them. So livestock or cattle, all their possessions, their goods, their property, everything that they acquired and all the descendants, lock, stock and barrel, okay? Packed it up and on down to Egypt. Now remember, Yosef told them they didn't need to. They could just come and he'd take care of everything. And of course, they're not gonna leave behind livestock to starve to death and, and you know, be in that famine. But, but it, besides that, they still, they just, they packed up and moved. They made, the, the total commitment, I'll put it that way. Okay, so what happens? Um, they came down to the land of Canaan. In verse seven, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. I emphasize daughters. Dina is the only one we know named. But there's evidence that either he's, there, the scripture is talking about daughters-in-law that he considered daughters, which we do that same thing, or there's evidence that I'll show you as we go on that probably there were more daughters that were born. We just have an outline. We don't get everything, but the only daughter we needed to know about was Dina because of what happened with her. If you don't remember, the, that's when the brothers defended her by killing off the Shechemites because she had been raped. So she got named. And he was willing to marry her, and I guess God said, no way. That'd be mixing you with, with idols? Yes, with idolatry, yeah. It, it, out of the, the promised line, yes. It just said that you try to make a right in God's eyes. He shouldn't have done wrong. He should have instead come in to proselyte to, to the God of Israel, and then and maybe he would have had a chance. I don't know. Definitely not a good way to start a relationship. Definitely not. I, I'm thinking of her, and I'm thinking if he's forced himself, how could you ever trust yeah. him to be your right. husband? You know, if he's yeah. willing to do that before you even are his. Yes, yeah, I just, I, I don't think Dina was a willing recipient to <laughs> put it that way. Okay, so we're ready for verse eight. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel. Yaakov and his sons who went to Egypt. Okay, and we're gonna get a whole list of names here. I will try to read it from my complete Jewish Bible to give you a little more Jewish flavor, but if I get too tongue-tied, we're just going to summarize some of the names um, because we don't want to get bogged down. But the first that he starts with is Reuben. Okay, Reuben was Yaakov, Jacob's firstborn. And it tells us in verse 7, 8, sorry, I'm in 8, um, the sons of Reuben are Hanukh, Palu, Hetzron, and Carmi. And I'm not guaranteeing you I'm pronouncing everything right, okay? I, I know a little Hebrew, I don't know enough Hebrew. Okay, so we have that there were four sons of Reuben. And then we read um, in verse, that was verse, that was eight and nine. Verse 10, the sons of Shimon, or Simeon as you say, there's six of them. Yamil, Yamin, Ochad, Yachin, Zahar, and Shaul. Now notice Shaul, it says, is the son of the Canaanite or the Canaanite woman. So that distinction is going to indicate that the other boys probably married descendants of Ishmael or maybe descendants of Esau, possibly even descendants of Abraham's second wife, Keturah. But obviously they didn't marry Canaanite because this one's being specific. And it gives indication that Shimon had more than one wife then. Now, I cannot tell you whether a wife died and he married again, it doesn't say that, or whether he had plurality of marriage, because we know Esau had married two that displeased his parents and went for a third. So we do know that there was um, marriage to more than one at this time. The sons of uh, Levi, or Le Levi, verse 11, are Gershon, Cut, and Marari. Okay, we've got three sons there. Now, Koath that's named, there's Koath, 
Amram and Moshe, or Moshe, sorry. So Koath becomes Moshe's ancestor. We see that in Exodus chapter 6 and verses 18 and 20. I'll read those for you real quickly. Shmot, Exodus 6. You're, you're ahead. If you're down to own and dying, you're in verse 12. I'm only in verse 11. <laughs> Sorry. Hang on. We'll get there. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 18 is how we know that we're talking about the same. The sons of Koah are Amram and Izar and Hebron and Uziel. Um, and then it tells you the length of Koah's life. Verse 20 says, Amram married his father's sister, Jacobed, and she bore him a Haron and Moshe. So the Aaron and Moses that we know in our um, Passover story coming out of Egypt, setting up the tabernacle, all of that, this is their ancestry. We see it right here. That's why it's important to know. Going back now to verse 12 that uh, um, someone already read part of, we have the sons of Judah. Okay, the sons of Judah are five, but two died. Okay, so we got three sons, and then we've got two grandsons named here in verse 12. Ur and Onan and Sheila and Perez and Zarar, but Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Okay? Uh, we saw that they died in chapter 38, verses 7 and 10. Remember, they were married to Tamar. Uh, Ur first and Onan second, if I remember the correct order. And they were so evil that God took their lives because of the Levite law that the brother marries the wife of his um, deceased brother so that um, the name can live on. Well, the second one also died because he was so evil. And then Sheila was promised that Judah said, you know, let her grow up and then let him grow up and then I'll give him to Tamar. So remember, Tamar sees that he grew up, she didn't get him. He, the promise wasn't being fulfilled, so she took matters in her own hand. She hid who she was, had relations with Judah, and out of that comes Perez, and that's where we come next. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. So Perez from Tamar, Judah's daughter-in-law, and from Judah. So father had relation. Um, he had to still be a boy when he went into Egypt because he wasn't born until after Sheila grew up. You know, Sheila had to grow up and Tamar had to see that he wasn't being given to her and then take matters into her own hands. So Yuda was maybe 40 at the time. And since Joseph was approximately 39 in, when he came into his position of rulership, Yuda probably would have been 44 to 47, you know, a few years older than Yosef when they came into Egypt. So Perez's sons had been born in Egypt, but they're included here to show that they took the place of Ur and Onan, because Ur and Onan didn't have that, um, yes, when they died, you know, the, the, the name has to live on. So it's going to live on through Perez's sons, if I'm confusing you. The reason why I say all this to you is we have to add them up to get to the number 33 that we're going to be told in verse 15. That doesn't count Leah. And it doesn't count, um, and Leah, Leah died in Canaan. In chapter 49 and verse 31, we're told that she, she was buried there. But here's why we're surmising she probably had other daughters than what we're being given in scripture because of how the numbers are going. So I'm not here to make sure I can dot every I and cross every T on every name and count them just right because it gets very confusing trying to follow the lines and what they're saying. I'm here to tell you I can trust the Word of God explicitly. And if it says there were 33, there were 33. But it would be like us. And we sometimes count a family unit as one, and somebody else comes along and says, no, there's the, right here I've got three in one family. So I call them one family, and someone else comes along and counts them three. That's why you have to just, you know, as you, as you do it, you have to get into the mindset of how they count it. So I don't see any discrepancies. I don't see anything to worry about. I'm just telling you, I didn't sit down and write number one, number two, number three, number four. It says 33. I believe it's 33. Okay. So 33 at this point, verse 13, we have the sons of Yitzchak, Artola, Puva, Yov, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun are Sarad, Alone, and Yachlel, 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 
oh boy, that's a tongue twister, okay. <laughs> um, and do I need to say anything? I've got four from Yissachar and three from Zebulun. <laughs> Okay, verse 15, we're going to, here's where Leah com, comes in. These were the children of Leah, whom she bore to Yaakov and put on rock. So when they were living back there for the 20 years, um, these are the sons that were born with his daughter, Dina. Okay, so Dina, it sounds like she never married because we're not given a line, we're not given, you know, another name. It sounds like she never married, okay? Yeah, because of the rape. Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe she was damaged goods. I don't like to put it that way, but could well be. Um, but again, his sons and his daughters, number 33. Verse 16, the sons of, and it's pronounced in Hebrew, God, but it doesn't mean God as we say in English. So I'll go with Gad for you all who usually pronounce it that way so I don't throw you of who I'm talking about. Uh, Zifion, Haggai, Shuni, Etzbon, Eri, Aradi, and Areli. Okay, we've got seven sons for, for Gal. Now we've got the sons of Ashur, or Asher, verse 17. Yimna, Yishba, Yishvi, Bariah, and their sister Sarach. The sons of Berea were Hever and Malchiel. So we've got four sons, a daughter, grandsons are two, Heber and Malchiel, and, a, and they are great-grandsons of Yaakov by this point. It's interesting that Sarah, S-E-R-A-H, not Sarah, but Sarah, um, is the only granddaughter that's named. We don't know why she got named and others didn't, but it's in scripture. So one day we'll meet Sarah in heaven and find out a little bit more about her. Verse 18, these were the children of Zilpha. Now Zilpha, uh, well it tells you right here, whom Levon or Laban gave to Leah his daughter. Remember when they married Leah and her handmaid was given, Rachel, Rachel, and Bilhah, her handmaid were given. Out of those four women come the 12 tribes, okay? So um, this is from Zilpah, uh, Leah's maid, and there were 16 from her. And it just tells us that, 16 people. So she had quite a number of, of children born to her. Um, I lost my place, I'm in verse 19. The sons of Rachel, Yaakov's wife, are Yosef, Joseph, and Benjamin, Benjamin. So to Joseph are these two sons. We've seen them mentioned before in chapter 41, uh, uh, you know, when they were, I think that's when they were being born. Anyway, we're familiar. This is Yosef, who is the head of Egypt right now, and Benjamin, we know, is the youngest that Jacob didn't want to let go of because it was his only son left from Rachel, thinking that Joseph was dead. So they were critically important to him, even though they were only two in number. Verse 21, to Yosef, to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim. You say Manasseh and Ephraim, whom owes not the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. So that's our history of the two sons that were born to Yosef. We've got their names. We're going to see that they're very important. And I missed in verse 21. Sorry, I skipped 21. I got in a hurry somehow. No, I'm, not, I'm coming up to 21. Sorry, when I glance back and forth, I get myself confused. Okay, so we've just gone down now to Yosef's two sons who were born to him in Egypt. They're important. We're going to see how they fit into the line because they are half Egyptian. The wife that Yosef was given was Egyptian. But we see very clearly from scripture that they came into the God of Israel, into belief with the God of Israel. And even the fact that they carry on and become two of the tribes that are named and given land, you know that they were considered Israelites, not Egyptian and foreigners in idolatry. Okay, um, verse 21. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becher, Ashbal, Yira, Naaman, Echi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. How would you like to call some of these kids for dinner? <laughs> I think open the back door and yell out for the names. Between similarities and, and hard to pronounce, and yet for them in that time, that was, you know, normal names, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, notice though um, that we've got 10 sons of Benjamin. But two of them were grandsons, Naaman and Ard. We find that out from Numbers, by Midbar. Numbers, whoops, I don't want to do it there. Let me get my other tablet, tab. 
uh, Numbers 26 and verse 40. And again, this is reckoning how it's done. Sometimes grandchildren were called sons. Sometimes we're told how many generations and we're given the names of major jumping over others. It doesn't mean that they didn't exist in between. So there's no problem with it calling them sons at one point and grandsons at another. Uh, they, the, the grandsons were sons too. Just looked on in that way. And if I can get my fingers to type right, I can get numbers 26 by my bar in verse 40. And we have there, the sons of Bela are Ard and Naaman of Ard, the family of Ardi, and of Naaman, the family of Naami. These were the descendants of Benjamin by their families, and they counted at that time 45,600 in the tribe of Benjamin. So this verse tells us they were grandsons. Uh, just to show you there's no conflict in scripture, again, it's just often referred to that way. Yaakov can easily be referred to as the son of Abraham, yet we knew he was really the grandson, just the way they say it. In the Hebrew, the, the term is the same, so you have to get it by what you're reading, the context. So verse 22, these were the children of Rachel that were born to Yaakov in Psalm 14. So we're just told there's 14 from her. The sons of Dan, or Don, is Hushim, just one. The sons of Naphtali, Yachsael, Uni, Yetzer, and Shalem. Okay, Naphtali had four sons. And verse 25, these were the sons of Bilhah. Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Rachel's handmaid, whom Levan gave to Rachel, his daughter. She bore them to Yaakov and Sam, seven people. Okay, so verse 26, when we're summing it all up, it says, all the people belonging to Yaakov coming into Egypt, his direct descendants, not counting Yaakov's sons' wives, total 66. The sons of Yosef born to him in Egypt were two in number. That's all the people in Yaakov's family because you've got the 66, then you've got the two uh, sons born in Egypt, and you've got Joseph and Jacob himself. That means that all who entered Egypt numbered 70. So if I summarize it, you had 33 from Leah, but 29 came because two died and two weren't born yet. Okay, so 33 from Leah's line, 10 from um, Zilpah's line, 14 from Rachel's line, Rachel, including Joseph and his two sons, and seven from Bilhah, and that makes a total of 70. So we're right on track. Now you'll hear people tell you sometimes it sounds like 66 came out, sometimes it sounds like 70 came out, we don't know which. This I think sums it up the best and gives us the most accurate. The 66 were when you weren't counting Jacob himself, Joseph, and Joseph's two, Ephraim and Manashe, that, that became equal to the, 12, the, other, the other 10 tribes. Okay, so that's how we get 70. Now, 70 is very interesting. Um, and let me say before I forget, too, when it says not counting the wives, it wasn't that the wives weren't important, but the name, the family names carried down by the father. The line was carried by the father. So in, in Bible times especially, to come into the line that's called Jewish, it had to be by a Jewish father. Now, if we don't have Jew yet, that's going to come out of the name Judah. It's shortened to Jew. It becomes eventually simultaneous, not simultaneous, eventually um, all the 12 tribes are named Jews. But the original, the first Jews were from the tribe of Judah only. And that was just like Jacob became Israel and Judah became known as the Jews. But again, by the time you move down in history, Jews are, are the term used for all 12 tribes, not just for Judah. But that's why I say there weren't Jews before. When everybody says Abraham was Jewish, there wasn't such a thing. <laughs> okay, and he was born a Syrian, not a s s y, not a Syrian, but a Syrian. So he was uh, a Hebrew because he crossed over. Then you have Yitzhak, who is an Israelite because he's in the land of Israel, and they're known as Israelites. That's carried down to Yaakov, but he also has his name changed from Yaakov from Jacob to Israel. Now you have the children of Israel. That's their 12 tribes. Out of one of those tribes, Judah, you have the name Jews start to be popularized, and eventually it covers all the 12 tribes. So that's how the, the name morphs, 
that the line is the same. So Avraham is a Hebrew, and we carry that on down. Hebrew crossing over from Mesopotamia to the Promised Land, but especially crossing over from idolatry to the worship of the one true and living God. Okay? Did I lose anybody on the way? Good. We're doing well on our journey. Okay, so let's look at that number. Verse 27, we read. Oh, I read it to you. Okay, that they numbered 70. <coughs> Old English says three score and ten if you've got that. And again, that number is including Jacob and Joseph and his two sons. Now, the number 70 in Scripture often is associated with Israel, or the nation of Israel, I should say, so I don't confuse you, with the nation of Israel in a particular way. Let me give you my examples, okay? There, um, this, these 70 are known as official founders of the nation of Israel. So when you know that the founders of America were, and they'll name the ones who signed the Declaration of Independence, you know, George Washington, John Hancock, you know, all the ben, Benjamin Franklin, all the different names, the founders of the nation of Israel are considered 70. Now, in Bamidbar, in Numbers chapter 11, if we run over there real quick again, in Numbers chapter 11, we have 70 elders that are associated with this nation, with, with the nation of Israel. Chapter 11 of Bamidbar of Numbers, verses 16 and 17. The Lord therefore said to Moshe, Gather to, for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the, the elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting. Bring them to the tabernacle. And let them take their stand with you. Then I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the spirit who is upon you, Moshe, and I'll put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you will not bear it all alone. This is when God's bringing his 70 elders putting the Spirit of God on them also so they can help carry the burden of taking care of all of the children of Israel and all their complaints and all their needs and all that needed to be judged and all that. It was 70 elders. Now they went into captivity for 70 years. We read in 2 Chronicles, and if you don't want to look up, I will for you. Uh, 2 Chronicles, we're going to go to chapter 36, and we're going to look at verse 21. 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 21 tells us to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Shabbats, its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation it kept Shabbat until 70 years were complete. If you don't remember the, the history from Melch David on down, they were not keeping the 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 year that they were to allow the land to lie fallow, that was the Sabbath for the land. They missed it 70, uh, they missed, okay, for 490 years they didn't keep it. Uh, that's 70 times they didn't keep it during that time, so God said for every year that you didn't, you'll suffer a year in captivity. So 70 years in captivity because they weren't keeping the law in the land according to God. God uses 70 years again, or I'm sorry, not 70 years, but uses 70 again, this time the 70 weeks of Daniel. Daniel. Let me just show you the beginning of that prophecy. Um, and by the way, I believe we're going to, to the book of Daniel next. We'll talk about that later. But uh, Daniel, Daniel 9 and 24. 24 begins, if we went all the way through 27, you have the whole layout prophetically. It's one of the largest in scripture. It gives us an anchor for what we read in the book of Revelation. In chapter 9, verse 24 of Daniel, of Daniel, we have 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish a transgression, make an end to sin, make atonement for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal the vision, and prophecy into anoint the most holy place. Verse 24. I just read verse 24 only of Daniel 9. That's the 70 weeks. That pertains to Daniel and his people. That's the Jewish people. That pertains to the land of Israel. When it talks about the holy city, it's talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So it's very clear this is a prophetic uh, history of the 70 weeks of, of uh, the nation of Israel. 70 in relation to Israel here again. What chapter are you in? Nine. 
chapter 9. Great prophecy. So much in that. So much in that. And it's not all fulfilled yet. We know the rest is, is yet to come. Now, there were 70 translators that took the, it's called the Septuagint, they took the Hebrew, uh, the original, you call it the Old Testament, the original, they took it and translated it into Greek. But it's interesting that it was 70 translators working with the Hebrew language. And in Yeshua Jesus' day, uh, by the way, Septuagint is before Yeshua Jesus' day, um, as Greek it's becoming the common language, that's why it needed the scriptures needed to be in a language that the people have. Now, and you know what, I think I spoke out of line. I don't remember the year when the Septuagint was accomplished, but it was early, early in this time. Let me move on past it, I'll look up the date later. But uh, 70 members of the Sanhedrin, that was the, the um, judging um, government authority of Israel, when Israel was allowed to exert her, her judging um, during Yeshua Jesus' estate. You hear that, that the Sanhedrin was a council that made decisions constantly, came against him constantly, because they didn't believe he to be who he said he was. Son of God, very God himself. And the last time that I'll bring you is the 70 witnesses to Israel. They were sent out by Yeshua. Look with me at Luke chapter 10. Where? Luke, oh, okay. Luke 10 and verse 1. Okay, Luke 10 and verse 1. And here we read, Now after the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Okay, where did Yeshua go? He didn't go outside of Israel. Those that, that tell that lie that he went to Egypt and went to other places, there's no basis of that in scripture. And he sent out 70 witnesses into the land of Israel to the cities where he was going to come and do his miracles and show who he was. So we see 70, uh, we got the official founders of the nations, the elders, the years of captivity, the 70 weeks of prophetic history, which cover more years than that because the weeks turned into years and, and we don't have an end on it yet and the 70 translators of the Hebrew language scriptures into Greek, 70 members of the Sanhedrin ruling council during Yeshua Jesus' day, and he sent out 70 witnesses into the land of Israel to prepare the way for him to go and do his miraculous work among them. Interesting how many times 70 is in relation to Israel. Okay, uh, and I think, um, I, I've got down and I don't remember why. I'm going to look real quick on my way back to Genesis. I'm going to stop off at Exodus 1, verses 1 and 5. I do not remember. Sorry why I put that down. Oh, because we're back to the counting of the names. Now, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Yaakov. And it goes on in, in Shemot in Exodus 1. It lists it also and tells you in verse 5, all the persons who came from the loins of Yaakov were 70 in number, that Joseph was already in Egypt. That's why they'll say, oh, well, then it's saying it's 71. No, when you count Joseph, remember, we saw that was, you went from 66 to 70 when he was counted. And then Deuteronomy, Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 22 also, and I think that's the one that has an interesting note for me to bring out too, but let me get there and make sure I'm not ahead of myself. Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 22, your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Again, proof that God keeps his word. Go down as 70, come out like the stars of the heavens, okay? Um, we'll go back to Bereshit, to Genesis 46, and I think we are ready for verse 28. Any questions? Everybody good? Okay. Verse 28, Yaakov sent Judah ahead of him to Yosef, so that the latter might guide him on the road to Goshen. Thus they arrived in the land of Goshen. Okay. Um, I'm reading from Complete Jewish. I don't want to confuse people, but I think it's pretty close in the New American also. 
yeah, it looks like to point out the way it just said it's similar. But anyway, the idea is apparently Yuda is becoming like the leader among the sons. He's the fourth son, but he's stepped to the plate more times than once now to show that he's kind of taking on a leadership role. And Yaakov is recognizing him as the leader of all those brothers. And he sends him on to go ahead, to go before him, in front of him, however your scripture reference says, to guide him. Or you might have that old English to direct his face. Okay, Yudah's going to go ahead and then he's going to be able to give them directions, point to them, go this way, turn here, do this, you know. And probably Yudah made it all the way to Yosef and made arrangements with Yosef. The family's coming. They're on their way. Where do they go when they get here? So he was just like their scout, okay? And he went on ahead for them. Uh, verse 29, Yosef prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. I love it. Yosef hears they're on their way. He, you can imagine how excited he is to see his dad. Every bit as much as his dad is to see him. He doesn't wait and let him be brought into the royal palace to where Yosef is staying. He knows he's going to set the family up in Goshen. He's told Judah, I'm sure by this point, direct them toward Goshen. And here he comes. He can't wait. I love it. Can't wait. He wants to meet him also. So um, he prepares his chariot. He goes up to Goshen to meet his father. Remember we said Goshen would be close to where Yosef was living, but it was also separate from the Egyptian people where they lived so that there would not be that intermingling. And as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. What a reunion. Father and son, who had not known Yosef in Egypt when his father was still alive. Jacob being told his, father, his son had been killed. You know, can you just imagine that reunion? And notice they just, they grab and they're holding on each other and they're crying and there's not a word said. Sometimes you just can't put it into words. It just, the emotion of the moment must have overtaken both of them. And I can just imagine when they finally were able to talk. I'll give you a quick example that will go to your question. Nathan Sharansky was arrested as a spy for Israel in America. I think it was for America too. Maybe not. Anyway, for Israel. Anyway, he knew that he was in trouble. He was trying to get his wife out. And he told her, you go ahead. I'll follow you to Israel. I think they were coming from Russia. I'll follow you to Israel. You know, I'll be right behind you. But he got caught. And he was in prison for years. And wrongfully so. He finally gets exonerated. As, I want to say 15 years later. It was a long time before he was finally he released. Lost, so. hmm? Not over the okay. Nathan Sharonsky was arrested, I believe it was in Russia, as a spy for Israel. He, he was wrongly judged, thrown into prison, but just before he knew that the trouble was brewing, he got his wife out, told her, go ahead, I'll follow you, I'll be right behind you, okay? Hurry, go, I'll be, back. I'll be right behind you. Fifteen years later, he finally is making it. Israel knew the media is going to be all over the reunion, all over wanting to, to talk to Sharansky and, and hear everything. So they told them when they were bringing him into Israel on the plane, they told him, we're going to sneak you in the back way. Your wife's in a room waiting for you. We'll give you a few minutes, and then you can come out and face the media. You know, And then they, the Israel rightfully gives them time alone. But I love it. They haven't seen each other. They, you know, again, how are they going to react? And he comes into that room. She was in that room. She's sitting there. He sits there, and they're just facing each other. And about the time that it, the, their time alone at first is going to be up, he finally looks at her and he says, uh, sorry I'm late. <laughs> then they go in and they meet the media. <laughs> I can only imagine what they must have wanted to say to each other and how sometimes you just can't put into words. You just need that time. They just needed to cry it out. But what is, is interesting and a beautiful picture to me um, look in verse 29, okay? Yosef prepares chariot, went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And um, where's the phrase I want? Okay, as soon as he appeared before him. In that, the Hebrew is saying, he appeared to him. 
the way it's saying that Yosef appeared to Jacob is the term, the way it's usually is referring to God, when God's glory shows up. So in essence, the glory in which Yosef came to Jacob is like the glory of God. And I see in that, when the Lord comes to get us in that glory, we come in and we meet our Lord. I just think it's a beautiful picture. The Hebrew just gives a little more um, depth to it. 22 years they had not seen each other. Well, say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. This is what God was showing his compassion. Oh, yes. Of bringing these two together. Yes. God, God's Mercy, heart. compassion. He Joseph, he knew, he to see his death. Yes. Joseph. Kept Jacob alive. And got him even down to Egypt. Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. And it says in the Hebrew that they embraced and wept a long time. Then I'm sure the talking started. They got 22 years to catch up. Wow, how beautiful, how beautiful. I, I, I would love to see a replay of this, but then I'd bawl like a baby all the way through watching it. <laughs> Verse 30, Father and Son together. Then Israel said to Yosef, Now let me die, since I've seen your face, that you are still alive. He's basically saying this is the ultimate joy. He is so satisfied, doesn't need anything else. Life can end here, and it's wonderful. It's just that's all that matters is, is to him now with seeing his son. <coughs> Okay, verse 31. Yosef said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh. Okay, I, I'll go up and I'll tell or I'll show. Now, God is a Hebrew word, and it means to be conspicuous, to declare it, to announce it, to report it, to inform. So, in essence, Yosef is saying, I'm not sneaking you into Egypt. You know, they know you're foreigners and they know you're here and I'm going to go declare it before the only one who is above me. I'm going to tell them my family's here. And it's just, you, just the excitement of enthusiasm. And I love Pharaoh's relationship with Yosef who said, that's your family, bring them, set them up. You know, he, he will see that repeatedly as we go on. So he's going to go tell Pharaoh, he will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they've been keepers of livestock. They've brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. Because they tended livestock, they brought their livestock. When Pharaoh calls you, so he's telling his brothers now, when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. So Yosef's telling him, hey, you tell them just like it is. You tell them, you're shepherds. You've got your livestock here that you need to take care of. You want to go on being a shepherd. That's going to guarantee you that you're going to be put in the land of Goshen. It's the best of the land because it's fertile and it's got everything that your livestock will need to feed them. It's near the water source that, that Yosef has for them. So everything will be good there. Don't be afraid to tell them your shepherds. Even though they're going to go, Ugh, they're going to put you in the best place. This is going to shirt. So you tell them, don't be afraid to speak up. Yes, Egypt doesn't like shepherds. No problem. You're going to land of Goshen. Geographically, where was Goshen? on the Nile um, banks of the Nile in that area. Okay. So, yeah, and that's why it was so fertile. So it was in North Africa? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Top of Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Good question. Yes. And Goshen was excellent grazing area. I think I've said that. It was essentially unsettled by the Egyptians. It was adjacent to Canaan. So they would just come out of Canaan into Egypt. They're not traveling way down in Egypt. Uh, and that would assure them again, their national, their religious independence, they won't be too close to have the intercourse with the Egyptians, and the Egyptians won't be having a fit at them for being barbaric in being shepherds. You know, everything will be good in this way. So it was ideal. It also was a sure way for them to be given that land of Goshen, the best part, given a place to live near Yosef, near Joseph. It was near the metropolis of Memphis. If you know where Memphis is, 
it was near there. I'd have to look at a map, but yeah. Memphis would be a little south, I'm sure. Memphis meant haven of good. It, the ancient Egyptian capital was situated on the Nile some 10 miles north of Cairo. There you go. So okay. Memphis is 10 miles north of Cairo. That goes all the way back to circa 2900 BC. Now, it existed until the Middle Ages. Its ruins, uh, that the ancient buildings were carried away to build Cairo, and the Sphinx and the pyramids are all that remain of the glory of Memphis. Um, but it was also the nearest to Canaan, so they're near Memphis. Not in Memphis, but near Memphis. And like I say, it doesn't exist now, but it did that. So they'll live together. They'll live in their own colony. They won't be intermingling with the Egyptian population. They won't be contaminated with Egyptian vices. And they're also going to be so close to their promised land that there's going to be that constant tug on the heart. They're going to want to go home. God puts that in the, the Jewish heart, to want to go home. Yes? Um, according to my old-fashioned Ryan Bible, it says in verse 34, Joseph can the notes for that say Joseph counseled his family to de-emphasize their shepherding, which the Egyptians despised and distressed their tending of cattle. I don't see that. From what you I said don't see that either. De-emphasize would be kind of hide it, don't say it. But that was a whole important thing. Go ahead, tell them. I'm telling them that, that you're shepherds. You tell them you're shepherds. You prove it by your livestock here. I don't see that. That's but he also interesting. He had cattle. So the, 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 they had cattle, um, not just sheep, yes, but they c took care of them. Now, Egypt, at some point we know, worships the cow, where cows were used in sacrifice with the, the order that comes down. I don't know how soon, I can't say whether that was already going on or not, but the, the live cells were definitely opposed to each other. Well, I think yeah. what they were saying in here was that when the term livestock was used, that maybe that referred more to cattle, so that when they were using that, it wasn't interchangeable for shepherd. It was more for doing something else like taking care of cattle. Okay. Uh, that must be what they're alluding to. Yeah. Um, but the fact is the same word all the way through when they're taking care of their livestock, their cattle, is the same word in Hebrew all along, all the way down. I don't see a de-emphasizing or a changing or a moving away from, but maybe so. Maybe they did not say that they were just directly, although it says to sound, tell me your shepherds. <clears throat> well, keepers of the livestock. It says keepers of the livestock here. So maybe that was a softer way. But, but look at verse 32, and the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock. They've brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. That says to me, sheep, cattle, says that they're shepherds, they're livestock carriers, whatever you call them, cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's because I respect him, I respect what he's saying, I want to try to think it through and get on his, his um, wavelength. But I, I don't see a de-escalating. I don't see a hiding at all. I see, yeah. you know. The word de, de what was it, de-emphasize? De-emphasize. That's like kind of a off, that's like the, that, that word in that close. Yeah, if you took that one word out, I had no argument with anything else there. <laughs> <laughs> and he may have a point that I'm not understanding. And also remember, Pharaoh really a favor of Joseph. Pharaoh's going to show that. We're going to hit that again. We're going to hit that as soon as we start chapter 47, yes. Yes. Before I get you, I told him, and then he didn't get to talk. We all jumped in. Sorry. I'll be right to you next. And the difference between livestock and cattle, um, maybe sheep herders, you know, would be sheep herders. But in livestock, you're dealing with the horses and everything else. The horses, part of the, too. The, yeah. the, the, the armies and stuff like that, too. You take care of everything. Yeah. Yeah. But it isn't a sudden change in, in the Hebrew language where they're hiding one part? No, they, no. we've used the same word. Livestock's always meant, or cattle, or she sheep and all, herds, everything is always, it's their catch-all word. And it's all the way through for them. So yeah. why is okay. saying this is suddenly making well, it less stuff, offensive? Well, the livestock would, would be even a softer blow. That's what the note is saying, Rory's note is yeah. saying. That I can't see it, but okay, I won't argue it. <laughs> well, then, 
again, it was kind of like a safety net because they, they were so repulsive, they just left them alone. Exactly, exactly. Right. And they didn't want that land. They weren't using that land because they weren't raising the livestock and all that would eat off of that land. But that's everything, sheep, goats, cows, horses. Yeah. Then they eat hay, so that's a form of yeah. it, you know. So. Wool, oxen, and all that stuff. Anyway, yes, yes. And no exactly. Pigs. And no what? <laughs> no pigs. No pigs. <laughs> a very good Jewish mind, Loretta. <laughs> no pigs. No pigs. Uh, you take me back to my college days. I missed a question on the exam when it was asking about all the different um, the laws, and they, it was multiple choice, and it was which animal were they not allowed to eat according to this specific scripture? And one of the choices was a pig, and I knew that's non-kosher, so I chose the pig. But it ended up being the animal that chewed the cud twice or something like that. Oh. And I was a city girl. What did I know? <laughs> so anyway, but yes, no pigs. Um, okay, are we good? Are we ready for Chapter 47? Any more questions, comments? Yes, Dora. But then again, the pigs have to be somewhere. Because all of a sudden they show up for, they said, give your feet the, uh, the bed spirits, remember? So, That's uh, in Yeshua, Jesus' day, because there were Gentiles around. In the Galilee area that Yeshua, Jesus was in, there was a large uh, Gentile population, um, but the Jewish people were to have nothing to do with them. Yeah. But yes, they were around. They were around. There were others, and I'm sure there were others in this state. You know, I'm sure, you know, the pig was created back in the garden, so. <laughs> but God kept them away, I believe, for health centers. Yeah. yeah. Kind of anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's a few other things we can add in there, but we'll stay on track. So, are we ready for chapter 47 now? Are we good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just want to make sure, no problem. Okay, I'm headed in chapter 47. We won't get far, but we can at least start it. Um, so we have, <clears throat> excuse me, then Yosef went in and told Pharaoh. Remember, he said he was going to declare it. He was going to announce it. He's not hiding anything. I think he was thrilled to say, my family's here. He goes in and he says, my father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have, have come out of the land of Canaan and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. So, and here again, it, it's naming it all. It's saying flocks and herds, you know, they're telling it all. Um, so they're, they're all there. They've all come into the land of Goshen. And he, Yosef, took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. So he took like a sample. He wasn't going to drag everybody in, but he asked or, or got five men to go with him. Five is the number of grace. And we see that in God's grace, they were acceptable to Pharaoh. That Pharaoh didn't give them any grief or any, oh, we don't want these people here. No, nothing like that. So he, out of his brothers, he had the five. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? So Yosef knew. Pharaoh was going to ask. They, they knew what they were to say. So, um, so he asked, what is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. There goes Ryrie's note right there. They didn't say we're livestock keepers. They said they were shepherds. So I, I honestly, I don't know what they're trying to allude to. Sorry, can't direct that. But just as Joseph said, they answered. They told truthfully that they are shepherds. And they said both we and our fathers, Jacob, you know, and the, those before us, uh, Isaac, Abraham, they, they said to Pharaoh in verse 4, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, play, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. So they politely are saying, We're shepherds. We can't keep our flocks alive in, in the land we come from, Canaan. So please allow us to settle here in Goshen and take care of our flocks. Well, you were out, Gail, you know, it says it very clearly when they're talking to Pharaoh, they said they were shepherds. So they're not hiding anything at that point. That's for sure, not softening any blow. So they're asking, they want to sojourn. They want to stay temporarily. They're making it very clear. We don't intend to stay here permanently, 
but there's no pasture in the land of Canaan. So we need to stay here at least for a time, be able to, to keep our livelihood going. So what does Pharaoh say back to them? Then Pharaoh said to Yosef, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. So obviously he had livestock. He didn't have sheep probably because he didn't like shepherds at all. But, and remember the cow becomes worship down in Egypt. Maybe already is at this point. I don't know. I'd have to try to research that. But here we go to, to see again that Pharaoh's not against them. He's even saying, hey, Joseph, you proved to be very smart. Look at what you've done for the land of Egypt. Look at how you've taken care of all this. You have other brothers like you that have got brains. Put them in charge of my livestock too. I like this. You know, let them benefit me also. So he was very welcoming and very open to them to uh, be able to exercise abilities that God had given them. And so he says, you know, I'll put them in charge. Um, and Egypt did spend, I'm sold in my notes and I'd forgotten, but they did spend much money and effort in breeding fine cattle. That was livestock specifically. So Egypt liked the fine livestock. Um, and I know it wasn't for slaughtering. So in this, we get a picture. We have a picture of the Jews coming back to the land after years of famine, which is the type of the tribulation and being blessed in the millennium. Israel will be the best land on the earth, no doubt, and they will have possessions and they'll multiply exceedingly as they do at this time. So even out of the land, we're still seeing a picture of how God intends to bless them and that that blessing will spill out throughout the whole earth. So we've got a beautiful picture here of God's grace, of his provision, of his taking care of those who are his own. Um, I'm wondering if I hurry through the next few. I think we can do the next few real quickly. Just get just a little bit further. I know it's 329. I'm watching, folks. <laughs> okay, we'll see where, where we stop. But we'll start. Verse 7, Then Yosef brought his father Yaakov and presented him to Pharaoh. So he wanted to you know, introduce his dad to Pharaoh. And notice that Yaakov blessed Pharaoh. Okay, when he's being presented to him, Yaakov is in the subservient position, Pharaoh's being the, the grantor come and live and stay and be kind, but notice Yaakov is going to bless Pharaoh. This is the strong man of God. He's standing before this ruler of, of the known world there, but he's standing there with dignity. He's standing there with the consciousness that he's representing the God of Israel. He's representing God Almighty. And this, again, as we carry a picture on it, is a picture of the Jewish people blessing the world during the millennium. Beautiful picture. Um, in Egyptian religion, the Pharaoh was thought to be a god. You know, he, he was the human embodiment of the god Ra, the sun god. Um, he was to be, you know, worshipped as a god. And so for him to receive blessing from someone else, for someone to say, uh, you know, they want to bless him, that's really quite something that Pharaoh himself seemed to represent, real, uh, recognize, and, and realize this is someone special. This one, his God is on him. And Pharaoh received the blessing from Yaakov, who is presenting to him the God of Israel. So it seems like Pharaoh really understands a bit, uh, has a bit of insight into who Yaakov is, who Yosef is. Verse 8 carries that thought also for us. Pharaoh said to Yaakov, How many years have you lived? So Yaakov said to Pharaoh, The years of my sojourning, my, my traveling, because it's not over, are 130 years. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. So he's telling him, My pilgrimage here on this earth, I'm just passing through. I'm a pilgrim. I haven't come to the end. Um, I'm going to want to tell you what pilgrim means in a moment, but uh, he hadn't come into the, the possession of the promised land in the way that God has promised him. Right now he's a wanderer, he's unsettled, he's a stranger in the land, 
that he knows his inheritance is the promised land. That's what he's giving that credit to. I'm going to come back to what the pilgrim is in just a moment. Um, okay, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Oh, the few years as compared to his father. Uh, Isaac, Yitzhak, lived 180. Yaakov is only 130. And Abraham lived 175. So he, that's when he said, my years are few. He meant they're smaller, they're less than those that had gone before him. And then he said some unpleasant, some difficult times. Israel's history reflects that. It's been full of toil and trouble. Yaakov brought it on himself when he'd be in the flesh. When he'd be more in the spirit, things were better. But he's saying again that the longevity of his life is not there. What he's doing is he's showing himself humble. He's not saying, this is who I am. Look at me. Look at how long I've lived. Look at all I've done. Look at how wonderful my life is. No. He's saying, I'm, I'm a humble person. I, I, I've had my ups and downs. My, my uh, heritage before me has lived longer lives. We'll see what God blesses me with. He just, in his humble state, he was presenting himself to Pharaoh, uh, but Pharaoh was recognizing him again as uh, one that the God of Israel has blessed. Okay, so I think, do I want to go back to the pilgrim right here? Maybe I can go ahead and read verse 11 for you. Yosef, so Yosef settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land. Now here it says in the land of Ramses, but the land of Ramses is another name for Goshen. It's like we live in the United States of America, and we call it United States, and we call it America. It's one and the same. And he lived in, they lived in the land of Goshen, or the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Yosef provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. So the ones that had a big family, they got more food. The ones that had less little ones, less mouths to feed, they got less food. Yosef was just being fair and seeing to the needs of all of them. Now when we look at that word pilgrimage, what Yaakov said he was on, and I might revisit this at the start, we'll see how fast we go, but this is the note that we'll tie up on. When he said that I'm on a wandering, I'm a sojourner like my father, Abraham. Let's go to Hebrews 11, and we're going to see there what they're really referring to in this and how they looked upon their lives. Hebrews 11 is our hall of faith. It's a beautiful chapter. Um, you, if you think you're suffering, you're feeling sorry for yourself, go read Hebrews 11. When you've gone through what some of those people have gone through, then feel sorry for yourself, okay? But Hebrews 11, let's start with verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. For he went out not knowing where he was going. We all know that. God called Abraham, told him to go. He didn't know where. He just followed God and he went. By faith, he lived as an alien or as a stranger in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov. All three of them, three generations, they lived as Bedouins, they lived as sojourners, they dwelt in tents, they didn't put down roots. They were all fellow heirs of the same promise. God gave the promise to Abraham, God gave the promise to Yitzhak, God gave the promise to Yaakov. They were promised a land, but they did not inherit it yet. They hadn't come into possession of it yet. Let me put it that way. So they, even though it wasn't settled, they knew this is our heritage. This, this is our inheritance, okay? This is where we're going to go. Um, did I read all I wanted? No. This is why, though, they I just closed my Bible. Sorry. This is why they said that they had settled while they were wanderers. 4, verse 10, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He looked at, yes, I've been promised a land here, but my ultimate, my where I'll put down roots forever, where I will live forever, is in a city that's made not by earthly hands. The architect and the builder of that city is God. He knew heaven was his eternal home. And that's the direction he was looking at. So he was willing to call himself a sojourner, even though God had promised him an earthly land. And we are that way. This is not our permanent home. We're just a traveling through. In fact, there used to be a group that saying that called themselves passing through because they were just passing through. We are ambassadors from heaven in essence, not that we've been there first, 
that we're ambassadors representing our home. We're also having our eyes set on that city that the foundations, the builder, the architect is the Lord, is God himself. And that is our permanent place. We too are like Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We are pilgrims and we're just traveling through, looking for that time when we'll see that destination that is so glorious, we can't even compare it to anything on this earth. And that's a great note to end on, but that's, he gave that testimony, that testimony is what was represented to Pharaoh. When we go back, we're going to see what happens to them as they settle in this land of, of Goshen. I'll give you a little more statistics on Goshen. Maybe I'll even put a map up so we can see where it is. It'll be a good place to start, and we'll see how they do. How do they fare in a foreign land? What happens to them? What goes on? Um, trying to think where else we're coming. We're coming up soon to the end of Yaakov's life. I feel like I'll lose a friend, <laughs> but I'll see him again. Or I'll see him for the first time, but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, come back and we'll see how they do in the land of Egypt. We know how they end up 400 years later, but how do they do as this family of 70 and what t takes place? And what is ya Yaakov going to ask of Yosef? And what does Yaakov say that is so profound that we're studying it 2,000 years later? We're studying it longer than that, 4,000 years later. And we're still looking to see it all because we're going to go into that great prophecy. So we've got a good study coming of what's coming up. And that will bring us very close to the end of the book of Bereshit of Genesis. Those of you who have been with me since the beginning probably thought we'd never get there. But here we are. We're in chapter 47. And uh, we see the end coming. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed the journey. Don't jump off and miss the end. <laughs> the best is yet to come. <laughs> OK? Um, I'm going to close in prayer real quick because of the time and then open it to questions and comments. How we praise you. God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are the God of Israel. You are the God who is faithful, always. You keep your word to a thousand generations. Your promises to Israel, earthly promises, sure and true, and your heavenly promises also, just as surely true. And we, as those grafted in, or those who come in through our spiritual uh, faith in you as our savior, Lord, we thank you that we too know we are ambassadors. We know that we are traveling through as pilgrims and we know that there's an eternal home awaiting for us also. Lord, we're anxious to see it. We're anxious to go home and be with you and be in the glory of your presence forever and ever. But Lord, may we stay as long as you want, active in service for you, that we might bring others home with us. Bless each and all who have heard this class today. May they retain what uh, is meaningful to them spiritually in their journey with you, Lord. May they be blessed and strengthened in that journey and ready for whatever is coming up next because of spending time at your feet, hearing your voice, drinking it in, and thanking you that you are our rock, you are our salvation, you are our living water, you are our abundant life, and we praise and thank you forever and ever. In the holy name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Questions, comments, we've traveled far. We've gone all the way down to Egypt and in a good way this time. <laughs> Any comments, questions?